Hello, good people. It is wonderful to be back with you. I am hoping today to conclude my series on distributism and then move on to some of the other topics that I've wanted to explore on this channel and get back to Ratzinger's book, Introduction to Christianity, as well. Now, I have been talking about distributism and elaboration of ideas and concepts that were based on Catholic social teaching and have to do with the economy. But when I mention Catholic social teaching, you might quite logically respond, well, the church really has no moral authority to, for me, so why should I listen to the Catholic church on these issues? And um, it may be that the Catholic Church at one time had moral authority for you, but it no longer has due to the misbehavior of some of its um, hierarchy. And hey, I feel you on that. If you say, why should I listen to the church about the economy when the church cannot even seem to run its own bank without it falling into the hands of international thugs, some of whom apparently are high-ranking prelates in the Catholic Church, actually, then I can understand why you would look askance at the church and what it has to say about just about anything in this sphere of economics. However, if you cannot look at the church as having some kind of divine mandate, then I would like you to consider that the church, despite all of its failings, is a great repository of human wisdom. It is the oldest institution in the world, and it has a long generational or institutional memory that is transmitting human wisdom, even wisdom that it gathered from before the um, beginning of the church. The church has functioned under every form of human government. Its members have functioned at every level of every form of human government, and members of the church have lived every occupation and state of life under every form of human government. The church herself has set up societies of various sizes for various purposes, has organized those societies, and has corrected them when they have become corrupt. So, so the church has this, um, this long institutional memory and a lot of human wisdom to offer. And uh, for some of us, the church also is transmitting to us uh, divine precepts and divine wisdom. So however you look at it, there is something for everyone to get, garner from Catholic social teaching, I do believe. Now, um, there's something that was very interesting to me when I became Catholic that I noticed. If you look at the schedule of the Pope, you find that there seem to be these odd little um, conferences or uh, audiences that the Pope will have, and it'll say, you know, a meeting with the um, with fashion designers, a meeting with pipe fitters, a meeting with mechanics, a meeting with surgeons, or you have all these different occupations that seem to constantly be coming to Rome or coming to the Vatican and having these audiences with the Pope. And at first it seems a little odd. Why is the Pope having these meetings with these different groups of people? Well, when you look at it historically, what you begin to understand is that it is actually the church that originally set up the first professional organizations, the guilds, the, um, the various um, brotherhoods of different kinds of workers and things like that. Well, what is the reason for that? The reason is that every single different occupation or vocation that people have, there are certain uh, virtues that are specific to it. So the virtues that are specific to say mechanical engineers are not exactly the same virtues that are developed in the human person and say nurses. And so um, in light of the church's interest in developing virtue in the human persons, the um, church set up these different organizations, looked at, you know, the ethical considerations that would be in every single different kind of profession. And uh, we take for granted today that, for example, that there are boards of ethics over certain occupations, but all of that stuff was actually begun by the church. Now, when I talk about occupations being involved with the development of virtue in human persons, that reminds us that the way that the church looks at politics and economy is as a political economy which means that we see politics and economics as subsumed under the broader category of ethics and morality. We do not look at economics, for instance, in a kind of mechanical way. Now, um, in recent generations, there has been a push among people who study economics to look at economics almost a, as a mechanical thing, as a set of 
forces that follow certain laws, kind of like uh, like billiard balls on a table, that sort of thing. But the church says, no, that is the wrong way to look at economics because economic decisions are decisions made by human persons. Persons are moral agents and therefore uh, we can look at these things from the standpoint of morality. You know, um, the social sciences have been um, endeavoring, some of them, to try to get some sort of scientific respectability by modeling themselves after physics. Sometimes that's jokingly called physics envy, that they want to be looked on that way. But the church does not um, subsume her, her view of the human person and of human society under that sort of mechanical scientific um, that sort of mechanical sci scientific category, but rather as a falling under morality and under really an elaboration of how we are as human persons carrying out or not the commandments of God. Now, there are certain principles then that, um, that lie at the heart of Catholic social teaching, and I've mentioned them before. I'll talk about them a little more elaborately now. And then I want to talk about some of the contexts in which these principles are carried out. The first principle is the principle of solidarity. That is the principle of the common good. It means that everyone in a society is, um, is joined together in a common project. And that project is a project of betterment. That's the betterment of the individual. Um, the betterment of the family, the betterment of the neighborhood or the, um, the community, the betterment of the city, the betterment of the entire society. And it's also something that links everyone of every strata of life from the poorest people to the wealthiest people. They are linked. That is the solidarity. We can think of um, Jordan Peterson's definition of good, right? The good that we're pursuing. He, remember he said that it's good for me, it's good for my family, it's good for my society. It's good now and it's good in the future. So this is the common good that the church talks about. And this common project of betterment is one that we are all involved with in the society or should be involved with from at every different level. Now, when I talk about the common good, that makes some people think, well, then, since communism and socialism make very great claims to be for the common good, then the church should be for communism or for socialism. And then they will point to things like, for example, monasteries and convents and say, well, you know, when the church sets up her own little societies in monasteries and convents, um, there is no private property. Everybody holds their goods in common. Uh, they all work for the common good. Why wouldn't that work for a whole society? Well, there's two reasons. First of all, people who enter into religious life and enter into a life in, where they're going to live in a convent or live in a monastery, and they give up their private property, there is something that um, they don't have. They don't have families and they don't have children, okay? So their way of life is completely separate from that way of life. They can live like that because they do not have the duties, responsibilities, nor the rights of people who are raising families. The second reason that doesn't apply to the whole society is that what they are doing is done voluntarily. There's usually a very long period of, um, there's very, really a very long period of discernment involved before they even make the decision to give up their own private goods and enter into this communal relationship that they have in a monastery or in a convent. And so that is not how it works under communism and under socialism. People are not usually entering into those re, um, that kind of a situation voluntarily. Instead, usually there's a revolution and things are taken from one group of people and given to another. The basis for um, communist and socialist revolutionary ideas and the idea of taking from someone and giving it to another is really based on envy. And the church recognizes that this, um, this envy is an evil. It is actually in the scriptures, it says that it was that the devil sinned through envy. And so envy is recognized as a great, um, as a great spiritual crime and great spiritual sin. And um, if you, I did a video about that last time about envy. And so 
Envy is not the right basis for society, and that is the basis for communism and socialism. And this idea of taking things from people, not, not people giving them up voluntarily, but taking things from people is, of course, a violation of the command against stealing. The church, therefore, is actually against every form of collectivism. We can say that the church stands with the human person against the collective. Now, the second principle, main principle of Catholic social teaching is that of subsidiarity. Subsidiarity is a principle that deals with the fact that there are different levels of society and that each level has its own sphere of responsibility and agency. So uh, we can think about it in terms of the United States government. Um, we have government in different levels. So you have your local township or your local city, then you have your counties, you have your state, and you have your fed federal government. Well, what the Catholic Church says is that government should be at the lowest level. The, um, every dis the decisions that are made and the responsibilities that are taken should be at the lowest level possible. It, um, and it goes even further than that. It actually is the principle that says that you don't even need a higher level of organization if the lower level of organization can take care of its own needs. In other words, any higher level of organization has to justify its existence on the basis of the aid, the subsidium that it gives to the lower level. The uh, lower levels do not have to justify their existence to the higher, it's vice versa. And so the, um, the, the church really advocates for us to have a lot of mediating or intermediate groups. And what does this mean when we talk about mediating institutions or intermediate groups? Well, I want you to remember the picture from Tenement Square years ago with a little man standing in front of the giant, um, the the giant tank, you know, how small he looked, how big the tank looked. And you can think of that as an image of state power versus the individual. It's so easy for us to be obliterated or rolled over by a state, which is so large and so powerful. And so what the church advocates is for us to have very thick layers of buffering between us and the power of the state, what we would call a kind of thick social life. And what are these various institutions? Well, the first one, of course, is the family. But beyond that, there's any kind of community institutions, cultural groups, um, parent-teacher organizations, uh, sports clubs, cultural, um, cultural things like theaters or music groups or things like that. In other words, the more of these mediating institutions we have, the more we can join together with our neighbors to accomplish things and not rely upon the state power. And the more we are buffered from dealing directly with the, having to deal directly from the, between the person and the power of the state. And in fact, um, it was kind of an iconic image that man with the tank but it's interesting that one of the things you don't see under a communist uh, regimes and under China are all of these thick layer of mediating institutions that um, so enrich the life of people in free countries and especially in the United States as a great feature of our common life. Now what I want to do is read some um, quotations from church teaching about um, the principle of subsidiarity. So the Catechism of the Catholic Church says the principle of subsidiarity is opposed to all forms of collectivism. It sets limits for state intervention. It aims at harmonizing the relationships between individuals and societies. Um, in Pope John Paul II in his letter Santissimus Annus, now this is a um, this is a letter he wrote on the 100th anniversary of Rerum Novarum. He said, according to Rerum Novarum in the whole social doctrine of the church, the social nature of man is not completely fulfilled in the state, but is realized in various intermediary groups, beginning with the family and including economic, social, political, and cultural groups, which stem from human nature itself and have their own autonomy, always with a view to the common good. 
um, in the Second Vatican Council Pastoral Constitution on the Church in the Modern World, it said authorities, and this talking really about state authorities, authorities must be aware of hindering family, social, or cultural groups, as well as intermediate bodies and institutions. They must not depri deprive them of their own lawful and effective activity, but should rather strive to promote them willingly and in an orderly fashion. For their part, citizens, both as individuals and in association, should be on guard against granting government too much authority and inappropriately seeking from it excessive conveniences and advantages with a consequent weakening of the sense of responsibility on the part of individuals, families, and social groups. And then um, in um, Santissima Santa's Pope, John Paul II said, that um, or talked about what um, would be the, the necessity of the state to intervene when there was a need, that subsidium was needed. And he said, in exceptional circumstances, the state can also exercise a substitute function when sectors or business systems are too weak or just getting underway and not equal to the task at hand. Such supplement, supplementary interventions, which are justified by urgent reasons, Touching the common good must be as brief as possible, so as to avoid removing permanently from society and business systems the functions which are properly theirs, and so as to avoid enlarging excessively the sphere of state intervention to the detriment of both economic and civil freedom. Now, one of the problems that we have in, in our system is that things will be put into place by the government using um, some kind of emergency, you know, excuse that there's an emergency that they have to deal with. And then it seems once that bureaucracy is set up, it never goes away. We can't get rid of it. Um, Pope John Paul II goes on to talk about what is called the welfare state, or the church also calls it the social assistance state, and talks about that the principle of subsidiarity must be respected. A community of a higher order should not interfere in the internal life of a community of lower order, depriving the latter of its functions, but rather should support it in case of need and help to coordinate its activity with the rest of society, always with a view to the common good. By intervening directly and depriving society of its responsibility, the social assistance state leads to a loss of human energies and an inordinate increase in public agencies, which are dominated more by bureaucratic ways of thinking than by concern for serving their clients, and which are accompanied by an enormous increase in spending. It would appear needs are best understood and satisfied by people who are closest to them. And so again, that principle of subsidiarity that um, we take, that the organization and the, the um, um, governance should be at the lowest level. When needs have to be met from a higher level, it should be as brief as possible and then hands off to allow that lower level to function. Now, if we're going to insist that the lower level so it should be governing themselves, then we also have to exist to insist on their responsibility to care for their own needs and to, um, to be energetic and, and to work hard in, um, in caring for one another within that level of society so that they don't need help from the um, higher levels. Now, the most important mediating institution, of course, is that of the family. The church stands with the family against the state but it also stands with the family against individualism. That is a kind of, um, a kind of egoism or me firstism that would, that would um, subsume family responsibilities under personal desire and um, personal, you know, the idea of, of some sort of personal freedom where you can um, dissolve all of your family ties or dissolve your responsibility to the family because you're pursuing your own interests. So the, the fact that the church has this particular interest in the family means that the family becomes an arena for conflict, sometimes conflict with personal, um, personal sin or, or in, individual um, in, individual ambitions, but also 
with the state, a conflict with the state in terms of the family. The reason is that the family is the basic cell of society, and it is also the basic cell of the church. In fact, the church calls the family the domestic church. And so since the family is the basic cell of both the church and of the society or the state, then it becomes that intersection point that can be a point of conflict. That is why so many of the conflicts that the church has with the state have to do with the family. Things like the definition of marriage, the responsibilities of, of marriage, um, the interest of the state in the rearing and education of children versus the interest of the church in the rearing and education of children, all of that kind of things. We can see why that's such a point of tension and conflict when we understand what the family is. I have a friend who likes to say that Catholic social teaching can be summed up very simply by saying, if it's good for the family, it's good. And if it's bad for the family, it's bad. Now, another principle of Catholic social teaching is the dignity of the human person based on the human person being made in the image of God. Persons are ends in themselves. They are not to be the means to some other end. But it also includes that the work that is worthy of the dignity of a person will contribute to the common good. And I had a conversation about some of this stuff with John Verveke. We talked about the kind of work that people do as being um, an evidence of the role of the human person as a priest, mediating between different levels of reality. In that conversation, I use the example of a hunter who goes out and um, goes out into the environment and finds game and then brings it back and offers it up to his community. So he's mediating between the level of where the animals are and his human community. But all human work does that. It is a gathering together of the resources at one level and then offering it up or benefiting the community at another level. One of the big problems that we have in our society is that many people are engaging in um, money-making activities <laughs> that really do not contribute to the common good and often may be deleterious to the common good. Now, we have many contexts in which we carry out these principles. Of course, the first context in which the human person exists and is actually responsible for the existence of the human person is that of the family. So we can see how the, um, the principle of um, subsidiarity and solidarity would work within the family. The family members are united in solidarity with one another in a common project that, um, that supports the, in, the individual progress of each one of the persons in the family in virtue. And also they're in, um, in a system of subsidiarity in that the family itself as a unit of society should be attempting to take care of its own needs among its members before it asks for help or subsistence from outside of the family. There are, um, there are some things that really militate against families in our society. One is, as I mentioned before, the individualism. And another one is consumerism. Um, it's to the benefit of some outside entities that families would be greatly involved in trying to buy a lot of things. Now, um, this is what something that John Berbeke talked about, modal confusion, where we try to satisfy our being by having. And even Jesus Christ said that if, even if a man possesses a lot of things, his life does not originate in the things that he possesses. Many spiritual traditions recognize that devotion to materialism and to trying to acquire a lot of things is a disturbance in the soul of a person. And it can definitely disturb and create a lack of peace and contentment in family life if there's a great devotion to acquiring material goods. The church sets up a couple of ideals, we would say, of family life that families can look at. Now, um, one is the rural family. The church has said, or Pope Benedict actually said, that the rural family should be restored to the heart of Catholic social teaching. Why is that? It's because that is an ideal. It doesn't mean that every family 
<laughs> you know, has to be living a rural life. But what it means is that the church is say, saying, here's an ideal situation because you have a family that has ownership of its own productive property, uh, working together multi-generationally um, to improve their property and to take care of their own needs. And one of the reasons the church considers it ideal is because that family is a free family. That family is free to worship and to organize its time and to use its resources according to, um, according to the movement of the spirit, to, um, to share with neighbors, to make, um, to make things better. So that is, that is really kind of an ideal to look at, even though all Catholic families don't live a rural life. That's a kind of an ideal for us to look at in the kind of structures that the church considers to be very healthy for family life. Another ideal that the church sets up for us is that of the Holy Family. That is Jesus, Mary, and Joseph in their home in Nazareth. And um, that's a family that where you see is working with their hands because Joseph was a carpenter, taught Jesus to be a carpenter. And um, you, again, you have a family not extremely wealthy, but providing for their own needs by physical labor and, and with um, Jesus and Mary at the heart of that family. And, um, and the church encourages all of us to have Jesus and his mother at the heart of our families. Another ideal that the, that the church offers to families is the monasteries and convents. Now, I said before that family life was very different from that, but that doesn't mean that we don't learn from the lives of people who live in convents and monasteries, who live the religious life, their devotion to prayer, their relativism of all uh, temporal goods. Those are things that help to encourage and, and teach us in family life what are the ideals of, of Christian living. The, um, the church really promotes that families should be in association with each other. Parishes are an association of families and um, various communities and community groups are associations of families. And this helps to have that thick social life. Really smaller is better. Small groups are better. Um, they are more easily managed, but they also fulfill the human need to be in contact with people that we know. We're finding out more and more sociologists and psychologists are finding out more and more that being part of very large groups is very difficult and stressful for people. We really have kind of an optimal number, somewhere between 100 and 200 relationships that we really can manage with any uh, degree of success without being overwhelmed and overstressed. And so, um, you know, we can promote being part of smaller groups within our society that will um, provide us with that, that close human contact, friendship and assistance that we need and that we can contribute to. Because one of the things about being in large groups is that the person feels that they're kind of like just a number or their, their activity is not important. They're not having much of an impact on a very large group. But if you're part of a small group, you can see how your own personal contribution really helps to make things better within that group. Families need capital. <laughs> okay, they need homes. They need property. Um, this is this is why the church never says that that a system of free market capitalism is somehow evil. Although they'll talk about the rampant capitalism that that doesn't see any limits to the acquisition of property on, in the in the um, hands of the very wealthy, but the church recognizes that families need capital and that wealth is not evil. Um, Distributus from the very beginning have warned them about the concentration of wealth in the hands of just a few. Um, the way that the church approaches this is to encourage those who are wealthy to share and to give. It encourages them in the virtue of magnum, magnanimity, um, to be a magnum, magnum, magnanimous person is to be someone who is able to give in a big way. So wealthy people can do things like endow chairs at um, colleges or universities. They can set up um, cultural institutions like theaters or um, 
or uh, museums, thing, libraries, things like that. Wealthy people have the ability to, um, to set up organizations to give grants and, and scholarships and different things like that. They can do things on a big scale that your average middle-class family cannot do. Problem comes when those who are wealthy use their wealth for political purposes, for political power, and then try to dominate their fellow citizens. Or as I said in my last video, when although they have much, they remain envious and try and take what those who have less have because they just want to constantly accumulate more for themselves. But wealth in and of itself is not considered an evil. And, um, and the problem is really when there's a concentration of wealth and when you have a society where there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of people at the bottom and only a few at the top, that is the situation that the church really wants to avoid. The middle class is, having a strong middle class is really important. It's very, very important for having political stability um, and for having what the church calls the peace of good order, okay? Um, a strong middle class means that people have enough resources to live dignified lives, to raise up their children, to educate their children, and um, it increases the solidarity within a population because that large middle class there, um, you know, people have the chance to become very wealthy, but also you have people at the bottom have a chance to move into the middle class. If all you have is extreme wealth and a lot of poverty, the people that are at the bottom know that they can never get um, they can never improve their situation. There's no ladder going up economically. Now, I previously discussed um, business context for distributism. I want to go back and say one thing about this um, poverty and wealth. It actually says in the Bible, um, there's a prayer, give me neither poverty nor riches, riches that I do not forget God and poverty that I am not tempted to steal. So there is a temptation of those who are wealthy to forget their dependence upon God and to feel like a sense of pride and egotism that, you know, I have accomplished all of this by myself and to forget that everything that they have is really a blessing. Um, we previously discussed various businesses, business contexts in which distributism can operate in the principles of subsidiarity and solidarity can operate, um, such as worker co-ops and um, um, cooperative businesses. Um, we've talked about the Mondragon Corporation and things like that. Um, what about the larger context of our entire economy? So we are facing a very big problem. We understand that socialism means that the state owns the means of production, which really means the means of production end up in the hands of a very few. The problem we have in our society is that we have corporate socialism. So rather than the um, state owning the means of production, the state itself is being owned by the corporations, by those who own the means of production. So it kind of flips from socialism, but it still ends up in the same problem with a concentration of wealth and power in the hands of a few to be frank about it, none of us really know the solution to the problem. It is kind of a bell the cat problem, meaning that we can think of ways in which power could be exerted to solve the problem, but then who's got that power, right? That's the problem. So we do have a very serious problem and we don't have a good, clear way to get out of it. The problem is that we didn't listen to Rerum Novarum 100 years ago when it was first written, or it's over 100 years ago now. If we would have listened to that and begin to apply it then, maybe we wouldn't be in this situation. Now, there, are, there is pushback against this um, corporate socialism that we have right now. Uh, one of the ways of pushing back is through community rights. Community rights, um, the community rights movement is um, ways of legally 
under the United States Constitution, legally fighting back against corporate power, uh, not allowing corporations to come into a community and do something to the community that the entire community is against. See, there's a legal fiction that we have in uh, United States law that gives a corporation the same rights as a person. And so the community rights um, organizations and movement is fighting against this and they have been very successful at limiting some of this corporate power in some very important ways. And I'll put some links to um, community rights information in the um, description of this video. We know that um, small local uh, movements to involve small businesses and local businesses and cooperate together even to th such things as having local currencies and things like that, cooperatives. You know, these are all things that people can do to push back against the power of the large corporation. Admittedly, a lot of this seems like it's just tinkering around the edges. However, um, the fact is that in some ways, that's all that we can do while we wait for systemic changes or work on systemic changes. We have to continue tinkering around the edges because a lot of us live on the edges of these very large um, structures. We have to remember that there are things that last. Now, Bible says that we have here no lasting city, and that's true if you look at it from the eternal point of view. However, if you look at it from the human scale, cities last a lot longer than just about any other structure. Um, you think about a city like Rome, it's, you know, existed for many, many centuries. Many cities exist for many centuries, even though the governing structures over them, the larger the state structures or national structures, um, may change hands frequently over the centuries, but the city remains. Families last, um, and we know our children once they have come into existence, they will live as long as God. And so we have things that do last. If your family had not lasted, <laughs> you would not be here. So your family has lasted for many thousands and thousands of years, maybe millions of years. Now, I've been listening to some young Orthodox and Catholic, um, mostly guys, talking about their hopes and their dreams for the future, their complaints about the system in which we live, and wondering, you know, what's going to happen and how they can operate, how they can set themselves up in the world, how they can structure their family life, their economic life going into the future. Many of them are very frustrated with the way that things are and are very anxious about um, the future, especially with such things as the debt that we have in our country. Um, but the problem is, of course, that really your family life can't wait. Um, you have to get going in life in spite of the fact that there may be large structures around you or over you that are not optimal. You have to still live and make your way in, um, in the society. So there are things that are out there that are very good. There are all kinds of good movements and there are good people that are doing things that we can cooperate with and sometimes we can bring things together that are very helpful. There's a large homesteading movement in the United States, both in rural areas, in suburban areas, and even in urban areas. There's a large movement to restore home economics. That is the skills that people used to have, especially in the arenas of caring for the health of your family and providing food for your family. That is, takes away some of that corporate power that's over the family. Um, I believe that distributism and permaculture should get married <laughs> because um, permaculture is a design science of designing human habitation in harmony with the environment and um, improving the health both of things like the soil and then reciprocally improving human health and then human energy and health going into the improvement of communities and, um, and really, um, making a big difference even in a small space. This is one of the reasons why I think that suburbs offer great opportunity. Now I know it's quite popular to batch the suburbs and a lot of elite people and, um, and academics and all really look down their nose at the suburbs. They don't think the suburbs are very sophisticated. They decry the, um, you know, 
the uh, what they consider to be kind of a waste of space. They'd like to herd people into the cities and smart cities and things like that. However, the suburbs offer great opportunities for families, especially if they can um, get close to one another and cooperate with one another. Kind of like think of it as re-villaging, right? Um, if a group of families in a suburb decide to cooperate together to raise food, um, they can make a big dent in their own uh, food bills and they can make a big dent in their in the health consequences of eating processed food. Parishes could um, could work more on becoming economic units where the members of the parish um, will sell and buy within the parish. Now, um, I've been looking at the Civium project that Jordan Hall has been doing. He's had conversations about this with John Verveke and with others. Um, and he's got a lot of visionary ideas about the future of civilization and the future of human habitation. One of the things I don't like though, is that whenever he puts up pictures of his ideas, um, and I know he's not the person who made the pictures, but it's a lot of what you call this vertical gardening stuff, you know, where plants are grown in high rises or it looks like, you know, the hanging, hanging gardens of Babylon all through a city or something like that. There's a big problem with that. We need to be getting our nutrition from the earth, from the soil. And if we don't, if we disconnect from the soil and try and grow everything hydroponically and vertically, we're going to end up doing damage to human health and I believe also to human psychology. So I would advocate for um, really looking at the suburbs as a way for families to own piece, small pieces of land that they can work on. And if we can move more production manufacturing, especially light manufacturing into the suburbs, then we can have um, a more integrated society within the suburbs that can meet more of its own needs locally. And I'm gonna put a, um, a link to the work of a man who lives in Australia who actually has done a whole series of things and written books about retrofitting the suburbs and his ideas for how we can change the life in the suburbs and make it more sustainable. So um, those are my ideas about possibly moving forward with some things that, um, that follow the principles of distributism. And I'd love to hear, know what your ideas are about this. This is going to conclude my series for now, but I may come back and have some interviews with some people, conversations with some people about some of these ideas. Until we are together again, treat yourself as though you are someone you are responsible for helping because you are responsible. So am I, and together we are making the world. Bye for now. Thanks so much for watching.